<laughs> so my name is Erica Wass. I'm the VP of product at Secure Code Warrior, which is located just a couple of blocks from here. Uh, I noticed on my way in. And for those of you who don't know, Secure Code Warrior is focused on developer-driven security. So we focus on helping developers and businesses uh, code more securely uh, at the very start of the software development lifecycle. Today, we're going to be looking at some common pitfalls uh, that are plaguing application security teams with regard to developers and look at how we can break some of those trends uh, and really start to lift organizational security and maturity uh, throughout organizations. I should mention a little bit about my interplay with the topic uh, because it's twofold, probably threefold. Uh, the first is the thing that we all have, which is that we are all consumers and we're all humans that are affected by breaches and vulnerabilities in a variety of ways. The second is that as a product leader throughout my career, I've been embedded with development teams, uh, building product, understanding what it is that we want to build, and then working with development teams to get it shipped. And then most recently with Secure Code Warrior, I've been working with businesses to better understand the challenges that they're having. So the one thing that I can say through each of those areas is that I'm very much leading with empathy toward the developers, toward the security teams in how they manage these complicated dynamics. Breaches are everywhere, every day. And you can see that the average cost of a breach is more than $4 million. And so there's a constant need and a constant overhead of what's going on in market with data breaches and how they're caused. A Verizon study showed that 95% of them are caused by human factors. In addition, security professionals feel unprepared. They feel overwhelmed by what's happening. And developers are constantly releasing more and more and more code at a quicker clip, at a faster pace. And the incentives aren't aligned. There's a lot of issues there. If we look at an example of SQL injection, for example, a vulnerability that came in the, the late 90s, you'll see that the same problems that were happening then are happening now, which gets to the topic of why is it that these issues continually keep happening? We knew at the very outset, within days and, and weeks of that vulnerability, how to fix it, and yet it's disincentivized at the outcome of producing that. So we're going to look at some of those disincentives uh, and, and really see if we can reconcile those two things with the audiences at hand. Developers, any developers in the room? Hands up. A couple. Have you knowingly shipped bugs or, or vulnerabilities? Question there can be yes, then the majority are. And it could be because there's time incentives, time pressures, lack of knowledge. Secure Code Warrior did a research study with Evans Data Corp of, of uh, 1,200 developers to look more closely at their security practices and their security needs. What we found was of the 50% that were a software developer that we asked the question, do you think that you leave vulnerabilities in your code? 48% said yes. 33 said no, and 19 said, well, it depends on the project. So then you like dig more into why that happens to be. Why do you think the vulnerabilities exist? And the reasons here are across the board numerous, but also there's a trend toward we prioritize functionality over security. So already we're starting to plant the seeds that the development teams and the security teams are a little bit at odds in terms of their goals, their priorities, their, rational, their rationalizations and their incentives. Next was we needed to meet a release deadline. The business says to the development teams, we have to do a thing in a big, hairy, audacious goal kind of way, uh, and, and there's no time. And so 36% said that we needed to meet a release deadline, and that's why vulnerabilities exist. Lesser still, but still up there, is we may not know what makes our code vulnerable. All code has vulnerabilities, and we lack the knowledge to address it. So there's knowledge issues both at the start and the end of that cycle as well a common problem that we see. So developers and security, we had a little showing of hands, a couple of people in the room uh, who are developers. What about those who are on the, the security side? A few more hands. So it won't come as a surprise then that the two aren't playing that nicely together. As a result of these disincentives and these misalignments, you see that, that there's not incongruity there in how the two teams play together. Let's see how it plays out a little bit more specifically. 
Now, I know this as well from the teams that I've been on. There's a task to do. It takes time. The team will scope it out and will do the work. And sometimes it takes a long time and sometimes it happens more incrementally. But when they're done, the development team feels good about high quality code, delivering value for the business, and ultimately the end users seeing the, the value of that in exciting new features or enhancements. And so they're they're excited, right? They're they're there. Every deadline. We worked on this for a long time. Look how the security team sees something very different. The security team says, whoa, this is frightening. This is not okay. Don't do any of that. This can't go outside these doors. <laughs> this has some serious issues. Anybody, any bells for anyone in the room? Uh, don't let anyone use this, and you really should have involved us in the design stage. We could have caught this earlier. So, feel when that happens, immediately blocked. There's a log jam as to why that's occurring. They say, well, well, we're on this track toward greatness, and then suddenly the brakes are put on. And so not only do they perceive the security teams as a killjoy, but also as a blocking factor toward that ultimate release, which is the completion of the task. So why is this happening? They're speaking different languages, not only the penguin and the seal, but also the security teams and the developers. And you can see this structurally in, in how this is coming into play with regard to how the business makes the decision on pen testing. The example being that pen testers are hired. The business may not know exactly what's needed. They're not digging in necessarily. They're evaluating testers based on criteria like, like price and reputation. In the competition for that, high quality testers will scope down, right? They'll downscope their proposals to, to what's okay and, and what is manageable by the business. But in doing that, they're reducing the level of interaction and the level of knowledge that they're having with the team on point. As a result, their deliverable is a paper with a bunch of items to do. As a result of that, the developers receive this, right? A mandate a bunch of things, a bunch of tasks to do. Uh, and there's little empathy between the teams. Their collaboration isn't there early on. It's there at the end, bringing negative feelings uh, on both sides of that equation. On the security side, developers are increasing the pace of code production inordinately. Teams are building faster, building new things, using new technology, and security is not equipped to deal with the bottleneck. The teams aren't staffed to say that they're going to, uh, to increase numbers in the same HEP as the, the code's being written. We know that over 100 billion lines of code are being written. There's no way that a human can address that in the way that we've been working. And that's what's necessitating a change to really uplift the security maturity in organizations. So if we look at devs and common vulnerabilities, how is this working in more detail? This is the cycle that we currently have, right? Dealing with software bugs and vulnerabilities since the late 90s, generally speaking, code is written, it's tested, flaws are found. They're then put through a machine to fix the flaws. Not a lot of thought put in into the, the, the initial stages there. It's more like, oh, there's a task to do, the task gets completed. The person completing the task may have not have been the person who wrote the code in the first place. So it really is a checklist item. And then it repeats. Oh, more code's written. Oh, we test. We identify the flaws. It is in a reactive cycle that is only perpetuating itself in negative ways for all the parties involved. So old bugs still performing new tricks. We've said that the SQL injection has been there for decades and still the same issues continue to arrive. But most developers remain untrained, unaware, incapable of solving that out in the first right. So Secured Code Warrior enables developers to engage in challenges, uh, to learn and to explore various vulnerabilities. And here's the most plagued talent content. And what you can see, which was reflective of what we're talking about, is that the injection flaws and cross-site scripting are the top. These are the long-running issues that we've had, and these are the long-running issues that are most played uh, and need to be most addressed in those cases. Let's look more specifically. In the result of almost a million attempts at a SQL injection challenge, what we found was there was a 64.36 success rate on the first run, which means that 
nearly a third of the developers couldn't identify and remediate a SQL injection issue in the first instance. Now, 64%, 64.36 could be good, but look at the, the wide gap that that's leaving. Anyone could exploit that, that space, and so that's what we're seeing there. In a bit of positive news, though, what we are seeing is the 89% success rate after multiple challenges, which means that when developers have contextual training and are seeing the things multiple times and getting a handle on it, they were able to increase the success rate, showing that developers can learn and that we may have an opportunity here with these longstanding vulnerabilities to curb them through a different way of thinking about security in business. Other challenges as well. You'll see here in the XSS and the IDORA challenges that there is a nearly 50% success rate on the first run. Which developers are best at security? We found that, that Rust developers have a 70% accuracy uh, with others trailing. And which ones are struggle the most and have the least? Uh, these are those languages. Developers. So it varies in the detail, but in the concept, what we continue to see is that longstanding issues continue to permeate uh, and continue to drive risk for those businesses. We've mentioned a lot about injections. Uh, last year was a milestone year. It was the first year that the OWASP top 10 named something else since 2003 as the highest risk broken access controls. So least privilege uh, isn't as effective uh, a technique at mitigating these issues as one would hope. And what the reasoning for that goes again to how the developers are thinking about their practices and how the business is aligned on understanding the goals of security and secure development. The reasoning being that if we think about least privilege, a lot of the issues that come up for developers include that it takes longer to deal with, that there are more edge cases that they need to handle and work through, that in doing the development, there will need be needs to retrack uh, and redo that on the way to shipping. And so it's an inefficient way of thinking when it comes to the development pipeline and the incentives to, remember earlier, ship things faster, right? We have deadlines that we need to hit and this creates complexity to that. So we need to rethink in addition to what we currently know and do about uh, least privilege, what it is that we can add to that to help the developers and the businesses be more successful on this front. Let's be clear. It is not the developers here <laughs> or the developers outside these walls fault. This is a structural dynamic that both the developers and the security teams have to deal with as a result of inadequate training, tools that don't fit their tech stack, no time to learn the skills. Secure coding is not a measure of their success in KPIs. Delivery to the deadline, meeting the customer goals are. So while the security team is aligned to the relevance and the importance of security, the development teams are not on that same journey from a structural standpoint, not as individuals. The AppSec is a showstopper, delivering bad news, poor solutions, not necessarily being able to align and understand the developer point of view at the same time as really understanding the vulnerability and the problem. So a wrong culture and mindset is to tackle the security problems, hence what we see generally, which is a low security maturity. So what do we do? There are things that we can do uh, in, in business uh, to get the AppSecs and the developers more on the same page to work more jointly, to understand each other's uh, priorities, to understand the inputs and why it's important, and then to develop, uh, develop uh, pun intended, developers are developing, but to really produce better aligned, more incentivized outcomes. Some things, and this is uh, looking at making it relevant. The idea is to provide contextual tools to the developers that affect their day-to-day. -day. Make it applicable to them. A generalized solution, a generalized discussion is only as good as a generalized output. And the developers are not doing generalized output. They're creating the actual in the weeds details. And so making a job relevant with precision content is important for them. Then we want to increase their skills, engaging training, building foundations, keep leveling up. It's not a one done thing. There's multiple ways at this. There are ways at the bottom to plug the most common deficiencies, and then to continue to level up and build more competency there. 
To do that, you can certify, you can benchmark and verify skills. The business can give incentives to become a security skilled champion. Someone who's interested in security within the development space can influence others and, and help them to uplift and uplevel themselves as well. And then from a corporate to be a top down. This can be, if this grows organically as a grassroots motion, it's great, but it won't take root as really a fundamental aspect of the culture. And that's needed to make sure that the incentives are aligned. Because if the mandates to one team is different than the other, it's gonna be near impossible to bridge that divide. And so for, for nurturing the culture, you wanna recognize top performers. You wanna call them out and, and say, this is good. We're gonna celebrate what's good and we're gonna, we're gonna see that. We're gonna give time to the developers to learn, to try this. Time is, is the thing, right? Early on, the constraint that was called out was, yeah, we know we're shipping vulnerabilities, but time pressures. So clearly there's something that can be pulled as far as a lever to enable time for the developers to do this. Ultimately, being proactive is time spent because it will reduce the fires <laughs> that occur at the other end of that pipeline. So it's really saying we're going to reduce the issues later and, and save the time now by becoming more structured about the learning and the abilities of our team at the outset, which will ultimately have a downstream effect of reducing the fires and the business risk that come with those breaches. And you can make it fun. Uh, there's a lot of interesting nuancy aspect toward this work that, that developers would enjoy if they're given the opportunity and the platform to be able to do that. There was an interesting uh, discussion that we've had uh, where people say, okay, you're farther along on your security uh, maturity. How's it going? Are you seeing less vulnerabilities? That's the goal. That's the metric. What metrics are you using? And it's an interesting interplay because what the result here is, you can see the quote. They say, actually, we've seen the opposite so far. We see the number of discovered vulnerabilities going up. So there's more vulnerabilities cringe, everyone in the room steps back a little bit and, and cringes at that. But the reasoning is really quite good. And that is because as the developers learn more and know more, they go on a hunting expedition. They suddenly find issues in the code that no one had found before. So previously unidentified risk is being called out through this process. As a result, the number of vulnerabilities is going up. Over time, of course, they'll come back down as that being done. So what businesses are finding is, is that as the developer maturity goes up, they are actually able to reduce the risk in their code base in ways that they hadn't known about or foreseen earlier uh, to best effect. So before we looked at the kind of awful cycle of shipping code, having it reviewed, fixing it, doing the same thing over and over again, here's a more virtuous cycle. This is looking at key tips and how we can successfully employ developer-led security. We can raise standards. Do we wanna ship known vulnerabilities as a business? That's an important standard to identify, align on. If the answer is no, suddenly the two teams are very well aligned. Those mismatches and incentives are no longer there because it's key that, that, that if it is misaligned, then at the very outset, the standards are not allowing the teams, either one of them, to achieve their best work. Instill contextual learning. We've seen that that works for the most common vulnerabilities and certainly will uh, and does more downstream of that as well. You wanna break down silos, as we've talked about, where the security teams and the development teams are friends and find mechanisms and inroads into each other's workflows. This is much more successful. Then assign and monitor responsibility and ultimately give devs time to succeed. It doesn't need to be a zero or one option. It can be, we're going to work on uplifting skills. We're going to make space for the developers to do this because we think it's important as a business and a security team, uh, the security team to help. And then the business can really achieve those goals of continuing to de-risk their code base and ensure that their customers are no longer at risk in the same way that they might've been before undertaking this journey. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this was a little food for thought in terms of you and thinking about how you want to contribute to developers and security teams bridging the divides and increasing the overall security maturity of organizations.